Thank you all very much. I hope you've all been fortified by lunch and had given it time not just to digest your food, but to digest that amazing morning of presentations. I want to thank the organizers and all the speakers who agreed to be with us today. Um, the organizers have done a spectacular job of bringing together people with just tremendous insight about the future we're now um, approaching. And um, the speakers have done just a terrific job. So we're starting out uh, the afternoon with a panel. And uh, this morning, we heard from a number of people who are really on the frontier of discovery and coming up with a number of new ways that machine learning, AI, computation can transform and, and are transforming the way we do our investigation and, and the way we will uh, practice and deliver clinical medicine. This afternoon's panel, I would call all these colleagues of mine a set of real practitioners who are really at the frontier and are figuring out how to use these technologies to improve the way they do their job. Um, it's a challenging time, and I thought that one of the interesting things in hearing from these five is to hear how these marvelous tools are being implemented in real time in the clinic and in uh, research. So um, I've asked them to in introduce what they're working on, giving us a sense of what we should know is happening in their hands right now and uh, what they imagine will be in their hands, not in the distant future, I'm not, not a fan of futurism, but in the reasonable future in terms of these new technologies, that is in the uh, area of you know, three to four years. I'm gonna introduce each of them before we begin uh, and give the, each of them a chance to uh, speak to how they see this emerging field. Um, but I have to apologize because there are many of them. Each of their CVs could take me an hour to do justice to, so I'm going to be very, very brief. So first here to my left is Anya Hanley. She's the Vice President of Process Development and the Amgen Massachusetts site head. Following a second postdoc at Yale University, she, uh, her first job out of that training period was at Curigen Corporation, and then she's been in Amgen since 2012. Next to her is David Shankind, uh, who is a general partner at GV. For those of us who don't follow the acronyms, that stands for Google Ventures. He was the, he's currently executive chair of Agios, where he served as CEO for 10 years. Before that, he's had a remarkable history uh, at Genentech, at Millennium, bringing impossible drugs to the marketplace. Next to him is Connie Lehman. Uh, who is a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School, and she's the director of breast imaging, co-director of the Avon Comprehensive Breast Evaluation Center at MGH. She has been developing and evaluating new methods for deep learning to improve breast cancer detection. You heard a little bit of what she's working on from her colleague and collaborator, Regina Barzilai, this morning, um, and we'll hear more about uh, Connie's efforts to bring better, more accurate, and um, more predictive medicine to our patients. Next to her is Jay Bradner. We go back a long way. Uh, Jay was formerly at the Harvard Medical School in Dana-Farber. He's now uh, president of NIBR, the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Um, he was on the faculty of Harvard Medical School in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute before he um, departed from that side of the Charles River to this side of the Charles River. And last, but not certainly not least in our lineup is Clifford Hudis, who is the CEO of ASCO, the Association, uh, the American so Society of Clinical Oncology. And before he transitioned to his full-time position at ASCO, he was the chief of the Breast Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City, where he was also professor of medicine at the Weill Medical College of Cornell University. As um, you can appreciate from these even brief CVs, this is a group of people who are, have been at the frontiers of their field, have all been active in this new world of bringing machine learning, AI computation to bear on issues of enormous importance uh, to um, not just all of us here in our room, um, but also the patients who will benefit from this work. So Anya, do you want to kick it off? Absolutely. Please. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was reflecting as I heard these amazing talks this morning and a great kickoff by Jim, first thing. You know, it was 1971 when President Nixon declared a war on cancer. That's almost 50 years ago. And uh, he did that based on, obviously, the challenges associated with cancer, but it was the second leading cause of death. Today, it's still the second leading cause of death. And actually, 
there's only a 17% improvement in five-year survival rates um, since that time. So really, we have a lot to do. Uh, there's a lot ahead of us. At Amgen, Amgen is known as a company um, that has, for the last almost 40 years, been discovering and delivering innovative medicines to patients, including cancer patients around the world. And uh, you know, we recognize the need to uh, focus on innovation. And we heard this morning uh, the, the amazing advancements in understanding of disease biology. And we feel that that combination of understanding of disease biology and technology, specifically data technology, will really give us great opportunity to bring these innovative medicines to patients more quickly. And uh, you know, as I look at what we're trying to embark on, about five years ago, Amgen invested significantly in our data infrastructure, and that allows us now to see end to end. Uh, Susan, you mentioned that uh, I'm in process development. In process development, our role is to convert molecules to medicines. So we work very closely with our discovery scientists and really then think about the patients and what they want and what they need and how do we actually bring these together in a very efficient way, but in a way that's thinking about the patient and what the patient needs. And so in combination with all the innovative science and technology that we've got within Amgen, one of the things that has been critically important to us in advancing um, our medicines to patients is the partnerships that we have. And actually, you mentioned that I'm, I've been the site head at Cambridge for several years now. Um, you know, having this close proximity to MIT and this whole ecosystem here has been phenomenal because we can't do this alone and we don't have the expertise individually in order to do what we need to do. So really, I'd just like to reflect on that convergence of, of disciplines um, along with the advancements in the science and technology. Right. David? Sure. First of all, thank you. It's an honor to be here. As I told the organizers when I was invited uh, to be on a machine learning AI, um, I can run my Mac, but um, that's about as far as I can go. So, but I've spent my uh, career, as, as Susan has said, taking care of patients and now doing drug development. And so uh, in my new role at GV, uh, I will say that I'm seeing at least one company a day or every other day coming forward that's getting started using AI and machine learning as part of some aspect of healthcare. And uh, there's no question in my mind that there is some overhype in, in the system right now, but these are incredible tools that are going to make an impact across the ecosystem. I'm not going to talk at all about discovery because that's really Jay's world and he'll do a much better job of that. It is incredibly exciting to see these big data sets that are forming whether it's the Regeneron Geisinger, the new Amgen, uh, Intermountain Health, the Biobank in the UK that are going to uncover novel targets, not only in cancers, but potentially now in germline, looking in polygenic diseases. I'm going to just focus just for a minute on some of the things I'm seeing in both development and delivery that will impact how we design clinical trials, how we conduct clinical trials. Because as you know, in oncology and in other therapeutic areas, We've been doing clinical trials largely the same way for the last three, four decades, and there really hasn't been that much change. But we're beginning to see large data sets come forward, both in oncology and non-oncology, that will allow us to do several things which I think will uh, speed up the development of novel agents. One will be getting a better <coughs> estimation of what's the event rate, uh, and being able to change that by understanding the patients we're actually enrolling in the trial. Imagine doing a trial of several thousand patients based on a very low event rate, but if you knew the right patients to treat based on large data sets that are out there, and you could change that event rate from 2% to 10%, you'd dramatically speed up uh, the uh, time of that trial and limit the number of patients who have to go on to clinical trial. The other part that I've been very excited about is the data that's emerging now on creating virtual control arms. Particularly in oncology, it's getting harder and harder to sit across the room or the desk from a patient and ask them to go on a placebo. And if we could get a better handle, and I know I'm sure Cliff will talk about this, uh, the work that Flatiron and ASCO and others are doing to get us a better handle on what is the disease biology and outcome for a patient population and use a virtual control arm. Then the last thing I'll say is on the delivery side, we're really seeing some changes in how we think about AI and machine learning impacting things 
like how we review pathology, how we review radiology, which is clearly both of those are going to start being impacted. But the other uh, two things I'll mention, one is early diagnostics. And so the work that's coming out from several companies, and we saw some at, at ASCO just a few weeks ago, if you could imagine diagnosing lung cancer more commonly at stage one instead of stage four, or pancreatic cancer at stage one when it's resectable and curable, that would probably be even more impactful than many of the drugs that we've developed. And the last thing I'll say, and it was stimulated by several companies that I've seen recently and a New York Times op-ed piece, is what physicians are dealing with every day. Certainly when I see my doctor, he never looks at me anymore because he's just sitting there typing the whole time. And there are a series of companies now that are developing AI-based uh, scribes where there'll be a little device in the room. It will know who the physician is. It will know who the patient is. It'll know the physician's lexicon. And at the end of that visit, just a conversation and an exam will generate a note that you'll hit print, give to the patient, they'll take home, and it'll be in the EMR and dramatically change the stress on physicians and make it better for patients. So it's an exciting time uh, for this field, and I'm looking forward to making the, the impact it'll have across the entire ecosystem. Great. Connie? So um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I moved from the West Coast, from Seattle to Boston, just under four years ago. And I was so excited for the opportunities that Boston would have. Part of my recruitment, they talked about Harvard and MIT and all the companies here. Um, that has more than been delivered upon meeting uh, the community at MIT, Regina Barzilay, and working together to see what we could accomplish for earlier and more accurate breast cancer detection and diagnosis has been really exciting. What I wanted to do is share a little bit about our pathway, because every year, every day now at Mass General um, in my breast imaging division, which has multiple sites all over the um, region, every screening mammogram, and we do 50,000 a year, is automatically pulled out of our PAC system, our image storaging system. It's automatically run through our MIT MGH deep learning model that assesses the breast density of the mammogram. And then that, that assessment is automatically put into our report. So as Regina showed in her talk earlier, that really is what our clinic looks like. With a push of a button, the, and it, this all happens within seconds, a push of a button, the images are in front of me, the report is presented, and I, as the radiologist, can accept or reject that report. That's a foundation, that's a structure that we built so we could rapidly add in our continued deep learning models into that foundation. But we needed it to be something that would save the radiologist time, not add to the radiologist's workload, and we needed it to be something that they had very facile control over to accept or reject what the model presented to them. And building that foundation, I think, is a, a model that we need to think about in all of healthcare. So the more that we can have the different domains of the experts in AI and the experts in healthcare come together to, to integrate, the more rapidly we're going to be able to make these changes. So Regina and I made a pledge that we first would start off with really, really important problems that our patients face. It's so tempting to you know, make a hammer and then start looking around for the nail to hit. And we, um, and we have a lot of problems in the breast cancer domain. Uh, we have two million women diagnosed every year and 600,000 globally are still dying every year despite all the advances. 600,000 annual deaths in the globe is, is a very large problem. But even more so, you think about it, 600,000 deaths, but we have billions of women. Most of them will never have breast cancer, and yet we put them through imaging and biopsies and test $10 billion alone for screening mammography in the US every year. That's a problem. High cost, variable quality, and, um, and 600,000 deaths every year. So um, with the density legislation, we thought we could tackle that. That was sort of low-hanging fruit. We, have, have that and that we built the foundation structure around that. We have other models that can assess the likelihood that woman will be diagnosed with a cancer in a year. Regardless if the radiologist can see something on the mammogram, will that woman be diagnosed with cancer in the year, within two years, within five years? And there are different clinical pathways that a radiologist would respond to by that information at one, two, and five years. So we're rapidly moving forward in that. 
The key um, pieces that I think were most powerful for us was being really committed to improving the lives of our patients and being focused on that, to being very clear about the specific and choosing wisely the specific problems we could tackle, and only tackling problems where we had the quantity and quality of data that we needed to address and develop those models. I'm seeing a lot of groups where they're desperate to have access to data, so they're accepting low volume, low quality data, and it's going to be bias in, bias out. We also wanted to make sure that what we were developing would be clinically implemented. A big part of my career was evaluating traditional CAD, computer data detection models, and um, 20 years of uh, research and development by various companies, <coughs> lobbyists that convinced Congress to pay $18 for every time a radiologist pushed a button to have CAD, um, resulted in no improvements for patients. In fact, in the end of the day, when we finally assess how did this do out in community practice, radiologists actually read better without CAD than with CAD. So we don't want to repeat those errors in AI. Um, there's a lot of hype now. We need to really be very rigorous in separating out the real science and the real impact from the hype. Um, but I'm incredibly excited about the future. I'm so glad you identified the full spectrum of the patient care cycle from earlier detection, preventing and intervening early as well as salvaging patients that have more advanced disease. So thank you. Great. Jay? Yeah, well, the work you're doing is <clears throat> extraordinary. Um, though today we organize around the concept of machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, AI and deep learning are not an organizing principle at Novartis, but rather um, a ubiquitous tool that exists now really through investments over the last three years um, in all of the phases of therapeutic innovation, drug development, um, and drug access. Maybe because of who I am on this panel, I'll focus on drug discovery. As an investigator, um, I had the wonderful experience of learning how valuable integrative analysis of epigenomes, genome structure, genome function, transcriptional output, um, could be when applied to the molecular pharmacology of small molecules that influence gene control. Um, through the lens of these molecules, we could learn very fundamental things about the regulatory structure of the human genome and also uh, the potential mechanistic activities of our molecules and their target proteins. And so when I arrived at Novartis three years ago, um, I found, unbeknownst to me, um, incredible sophistication around um, data science and a fully digital organization. Um, with our new CEO, Vasnar Simon, who's put a huge emphasis on data and digital in the um, full outer reaches of the organization, um, where our experience is admittedly more premature, um, we've had a chance to really invest in a generational strategy in applying modern tools like machine learning, like deep learning, um, to overcome slow steps in drug discovery and drug development. Um, and we could click on, double click on any of these, uh, but uh, to be specific, um, we've been disciplined to make um, long-term investments because we're a little bit um, lucky in that we don't have you know, R1, R2 renewal cycles. We don't have series A, B, C, IPO. Um, and so we've taken investments that are quite substantial against a research organization of 6,000 people. We have 400 data scientists. Um, we are building a strong foundation of organizing first our 40 petabytes of discovery and development data, 3 million patient years of drug development data, because we believe that first by organizing and structuring this data for interoperability, that then we'll be able to make the inferences that connect the disease states of patients to the chemical equity, 1.8 billion molecules um, here at Nibber. Um, and so many of these aspirations are long-term, but we do have some expectation that there'll be near-term delivery. We see that already in clinical trial operations where we've built a command center, a control tower that monitors of our more than 500 clinical trials intergalactic around the world, um, those sites most likely to produce a second patient to direct resources. Um, and we've seen near-term contributions to our operating efficiency. But in discovery science, though there is a lot of hype, we've tried to be really disciplined and diligent to apply machine learning in a bespoke way, almost like catalysts to overcome slow steps in the discovery process. This is everything from generative chemistry to suggest the next site for fluorination, um, that perhaps a brand new organic chemist out of the University of Basel, well, she'll know 
Um, chemists like you fluorinated the two position after the four position, leveraging 100 years of discovery chemistry. We're building large knowledge graphs and I think collaborating exhaustively to dissect new targets using biopsy samples from the only informative model system of disease, the patient, uh, to try to direct our validation efforts leveraging model systems. In early drug development, we're working hard not to bring patients to our trials, which typically operate in very small centers, but to bring, bring our trials to patients through a more distributed um, type of early clinical investigation. We've had great success with companies like Science37 and others. And as you'll hopefully hear later from Andy, we're working very hard to overcome one of our pinch points in drug development, which is it's very expensive to take molecules into human toxicology. And we believe that because of the um, advanced and productive contributions of machine learning to image analysis, that we can maybe do 90-day tox studies in one week with the right type of measurements and therefore bringing in more molecules um, to advance more um, effective medicines more efficiently. In total, there are about 18 use cases, these catalysts at Nibber, um, and we're keeping tight reins on, on this activity while we work more broadly to access the talent. And being here at MIT, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're hiring. Uh, but more importantly than that, we're collaborating because it turns out hiring machine learning scientists is really expensive as it should be. Um, you will find um, increasingly, I hope, as we work to open our research framework that you know, walking past our labs at 181 Mass Ave, it just looks more like another great research institute and not you know, a scary pharmaceutical company with snipers on the roof. Um, together with Regina, with scientists applying machine learning to optimize immunoglobulins through um, beyond panning and uh, biological experimentation, we're very confident that together we can reimagine drug discovery. Great. Cliff? Great. Well, I mean, I, I think it's probably fitting that I go last. I'm going to talk about real world um, and the translation of much of this as we make these advances to the clinic. Um, just to provide a little bit of historical context um, and, and context in general, ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, exists to enable its 45,000 members to deliver the highest quality care possible. And to do that, we rely on three pillars. One is um, education of our members. The second is research, either that we do or that we support or enable. And the third is the definition and measurement of quality of care. Uh, all of those things have been disrupted in other industries and improved. Medicine is slow to change. Um, as of two years ago, 75% uh, of medical communications were still being sent by fax. I don't think it's that much better today. I think medicine remains the largest users of fax in, in the world. It's hard to believe. Um, but it's, it's emblematic of a problem. So if we think about all of our tasks, Remember that medical education historically was anecdotal and apprenticeship. The modern clinical trial invented in the 20th century was a revolution in its own right. It may be a little long in the tooth, but it was a, a great and transformative intervention. In 2008, in the depths of the financial crisis, um, the federal government incentivized with around 33 or so billion dollars the wholesale and last mile conversion of medical record keeping from paper to digital in the form of electronic records. Congress believed in passing that law, uh, that funding, that they were supporting interoperability. And they were in a technical way, but not at all in a practical way. So we looked at this um, at, at the same time, uh, or rather in follow-up to an Institute of Medicine examination, and recognized the great potential of this newly created digital resource. The Institute of Medicine called for the development of what were termed rapid learning systems. They imagined that by dipping into this pool of newly created digital data that we would start to learn from the real world to expand the learning that we get from traditional clinical trials. Regina mentioned earlier in the day that only 3% of adults with solid tumors go on clinical research trials. They represent the sum total of the high-level evidence for care affecting millions and millions of people around the world. Looked at one other way to give you some backdrop, only about 15% of high-level guidelines decision points are actually based on high-level evidence. The vast bulk of what doctors do and call standard of care is based on lower level evidence. So 
we imagined that we would just plug into these electronic record systems, download all the data, and voila, we would have novel insights into toxicity, uh, benefits, off-target uh, benefits in particular, uh, off-label use, and so forth. But it turns out, and, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up about here, we're uh, now at a point with um, about a million cancer patients onboarded into our cancer link uh, project. Uh, we have um, several hundred thousand that are eligible for deeper curation. Uh, we have data sets available for exploration uh, through uh, our CancerLink discovery asset. And by the way, all of you who are qualified can apply to use this open source uh, through our Centra resource, which is our center for uh, uh, research and analytics at ASCO. I'm happy to provide you with uh, web links if you want to, to do that. Uh, but we've learned that this is really a massive challenge, and I always share this one anecdote. In the first year that we were onboarding data, about a year and a half ago, we were bringing data in from around 20 practices at that point. We were bringing data from 10 distinct electronic record systems. Each one of them is custom installed and tweaked. And um, the term white blood cell count, one of the most basic structured data elements in a medical record, was recorded 60, 60 different ways in 10 record systems across 20 something, um, install, uh, 20 something practices. We found 18 versions of male, female. There you go, <laughs> there you go. So the practical implication is manual labor. So we have to write lines of code to convert those structured data Crazy. elements that you think are interoperable and easily read into a single structure that can be then interpreted by the machines. And I'll remind you that when um, the name your favorite medical record company updates with a patch their medical record system at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday, there is at least a chance that they break our conversion language and we have to recode that and start again. And so this has been the never-ending experience that essentially if we wanted a system that blocked us from leveraging all of this big data, we could hardly do better than what we've done. <laughs> so uh, I'll close by saying that in, a, in a, an attempt to, to leverage our learning at this point uh, and to start to make this better, uh, we just announced at the annual meeting a project called MCODE, which is a minimal common oncology data elements project. It's about 100 elements that we think should be <coughs> recorded in every cancer patient and recorded one way, in a standard way. It is free for use. Mm -hmm. It is being generated by a consortium. There is no ownership. The only requirement for a person to, to the, the only payment for using it or participating with us, rather, is that you have to use it. Mm. And our hope is a little bit like USB standards and computers. We want the whole world to s gravitate um, to an easy, cheap solution to make the data interoperable. And, and the only point in all of this is with this, if we succeed, we will be contributing to a world where you get data uh, in the clinic that we can actually use cheaply to, to convert the advances that you just heard dreamt of into practical benefits for patients faster. Wow, thank you. Great, great way to tee up the conversation. And there are you know, probably, let's see, there are five of you. There are probably 50 ways I could start and 50 places I could start. So uh, we are at MIT. And we do have a research mission and an education mission. So one of the things I'm always interested in is where are we in terms of the people power to address the tasks that you all have at hand? And um, the people power being not just, you know, you know, not the people to, you know, enter hand entry, enter all this stuff, but the people to actually build the bridge between two very different disciplines. And, you know, I don't need to, you know, lay out the incredible difference between a computational approach to the world, and we've heard a lot about that today, and a biological or biomedical approach to the world. But these are uh, completely different disciplines, different vocabularies, different definition of a problem. And so how are we doing in terms of crossing that divide and preparing people who will actually be the people who will invent our future? And um, just to kind of illustrate it again, so that we're not looking to our computationalists as service providers for the biomedical uh, you know, uh, contributions, but frankly, real collaborators. So what do you see in terms of the people who are in your organizations, the people who are actually suggesting these ideas, 
And um, you know, where are we and what should we be doing in terms of preparing for another generation, new generation of uh, participants? I can kick off since I finished my um, introduction with that comment about mm. convergence of disciplines, Susan. Mm. Um, it is uh, incredibly powerful at our building here in Cambridge to see how um, our next generation environment um, is conducive to bringing these disciplines together, much like the cock, so following the, the lead of MIT for mm. sure and uh, really reaping the benefits. So I'm gonna to speak to two examples. So one, one internally, we have, um, you know, we had a desire to, you know, capitalize on uh, the opportunities to enable speed. Speed is a, a key factor in our, um, you know, mission at Amgen to get medicines to patients and, and many other um, innovators uh, across the industry as well. And uh, so we wanted to um, upskill some of our existing scientists and engineers. Uh, we sent out a request if there was anyone who was interested in learning Python. And we wondered, you know, how many people would raise their hands. Um, overnight, 100 people responded immediately. And each of those individuals had a, a project that they wanted to execute that would help them to, you know, model and predict and understand and ultimately, you know, deliver their outcome much more efficiently. Uh, scientists don't want to be hanging around waiting for data. You know, we used to always say, what are you waiting for? Let's not wait for data. Let's try and enable that more quickly. The second is um, the external partnerships. Um, we're privileged to be part of the AI consortium with Regina, and um, I know others are as well. Um, this has been a really phenomenal partnership, not just with MIT, but with the other um, industry groups part of this consortium. And through this partnership, we're actually um, having our chemists work side by side with our biologists and our computer scientists um, to predict mo you know, molecules, molecule properties, and ultimately help us with discovery of new molecules. And that consortium, it's really been a grassroots bottoms up um, consortium that has been um, you know, catalyzed by the team here at MIT, but definitely one of the most successful collaborations we've had. So I think internally, we need to have creative ways to you know, um, bring new training and new um, insights to our teams, but externally just ensure that we have those partnerships to try and um, you know, work together for these outcomes. Go ahead. Yeah, what I was going to say is, I mean, for me, it's been fascinating. You know, I've been in this new role at GV for three months, being part of the Alphabet organization. Mm -hmm. So I've met more computer scientists uh, between the Cambridge <laughs> site, the New York site, and the Mountain View site in the last three months than I ever knew existed on the planet. And what I've been struck by is the number of cross-trained young uh, individuals who have a computer science background and then have gone to medical school. So they're not, because one of the concerns I had would be, is this an organization where, as Connie said, um, they have the hammer, they know how to do the computation, but they don't know what problem to solve. But that's not the case. The number of people that I've seen who are young, who are cross-trained, who have a computer science background, then went to medical school, or vice versa, is really strikingly high. And I think they will be the future to make sure that they're developing computational models but they first know what problem we're trying to solve. And I think that's going to be critical. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think the earlier we start, the better. So we can link and leverage on existing requirements. When we look at, you know, when I talk to folks and they're taking their pre-med requirements of biology, organic chemistry, physics, well, well you know, what about a computer science? Yeah. You know, just to have exactly. the language, just to have the background. As Regina says, we're not going to be having doctors write the high level of Code, but they should be conversant, they should understand, they should be comfortable, they should be familiar with it. So um, I think we can start pretty early. So I, I can say a couple things here. First of all, when we tackled this within ASCO, we created a new company as a wholly owned subsidiary of our nonprofit to give them the nimbleness to move. Second is we put our data sets out essentially for crowdsourcing. We have external collaborators, uh, pre-contracted uh, statisticians who can compete to solve problems for us. And we have begun to fund investigators. So we gave our first young investigator award in informatics uh, to an investigator using both Flatiron and CancerLink data for this year. So we're trying to, to grow the community in multiple ways. Well, that's all very encouraging. And Jay, I'm going to actually ask you to answer my next question, because <laughs> we could spend forever on this uh, human resources problem. But um, you know, listening to all of you, I have two who pays questions, OK? <laughs> Uh, and you can answer either of them because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take time for you. But the first one is who pays for the data? Cliff, you've described, you know, you, you you provided these data, this data set for people. 
Who pays? This is not an expensive enterprise. Who gets access? Is it proprietary? Is it general? That's one who pays. And the second is kind of my favorite who pays question, which is we talk about early diagnostics as being the key to reducing healthcare costs and saving lives. Who pays for that? Mm. I mean, uh, many of my colleagues have, have, have had great diagnostic tools you know, in utero, and they just, you know, you, you hit the wall of no one wants to pay for that. So two who pays question. Jay, I'm going to start with you, and you can answer both or, or either. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> my immediate reaction is that you know, we invest $2.6 billion every year in research at Novartis. It's maybe one of the ways that we're a little bit unique um, in the pharmaceutical and biomedical enterprise is this belief in discovery research. Um, we do plenty of M&A. Um, but that $2.6 billion is an annual investment in data. And we see incredible value in this data, much of which ends up in the public domain. We publish 770 papers a year, not me personally. Um, some of it doesn't, maybe because it's not yet valuable, or maybe we as yet don't understand it. We believe the data is an asset, but we don't know for sure. Mm. There's examples of it. Um, Cliff, you talked about highly structured data and how important it is. We did a massive clinical trial to assess the hypothesis of inflammation in atherosclerotic heart disease called CANTOS that randomized patients to placebo or an interleukin-1 beta antibody. Um, it read out positive. The drug did not get approved. Perhaps the overall risk reduction wasn't great enough. But this highly structured, massive data set of people of a certain age has allowed us to go back and ask really sophisticated questions now that we have the proteomics and the genomics and we have really structured in, um, data with just one WBC and MF uh, measurement. We've learned things about interleukin-1 beta and its potential utility. Um, we've learned that it could help patients with gout potentially. And we've learned it can't do X, Y, and Z, which we now won't <coughs> invest in in clinical investigation, wasting patients and doctors' time and, and our resources. But we've also learned some nuanced observations that most recently led to a major acquisition of a company called IFM Trey that has an NLRP3 inflammasome inhibitor. And the acquisition of that business to become first in class in that space, the inflammasome elaborates interleukin-1 beta, was driven by the opportunities afforded from the computational analysis, virtual proof of concept studies in that highly structured data set. So we have a glimmer of insight that this data is really valuable when it's constrained and highly structured. But aggregated population-based data, we just don't know. And so we don't generate that kind of data. Um, we work with claims data. It's really hard to get actionable insights. I have tried, won't give up. We work with um, the NHS and Genomics England, imagining that by cobbling together perhaps a more restricted population with a massively expansive data set that we'll learn things. I think Amgen, you've probably had the best experience working with population level data. So data probably is an asset that probably makes it valuable to generate, but on the linear thread of drug discovery, innovation, and healthcare delivery, I think it's an open question. So we're all gonna pay for it, we're all gonna generate it, and only I think a small subset of it will be actionable. Dave. Yeah, two, two things on the who pay. One is, if you look at the large scale, and, and Jay just referenced that the large scale genomics, germline genomics work that's being done now with fully annotated uh, clinical histories, uh, Regeneron, I think, will do a half a million uh, sequences in patients this year. Amgen is going to do a large number, the UK Biobank. And so the question is, but that's still a pretty small number. How do you get to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million individuals? And I've heard two schools of thought who's going to pay. One is going to be countries are going to pay for it and do it on their own, or it's going to be some large consortium that'll put that money together. On the diagnostic side, I was on the board from the very beginning of a company called Foundation Medicine, started here in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and uh, to come up with uh, next-gen sequencing of tumors. For the first five years, we gave the test away for free because we couldn't get anybody to pay for it um, because we couldn't prove that it was actionable. Yeah. Um, and it's still a challenge in terms of with these diagnostics that are being developed. There's a, they're still early on the wave of whether uh, payers are willing to pay for that. And I still think that's a challenge going forward. Can 
I think it's all going to be based on a moving target of how how long in the U.S. will we be staying in fee for service? Yeah. Um, when do we move to a, a single payer? Um, when we look at global strategies, who pays? It depends on you know, what the market is out there. So I would have had a very different prediction of who would pay for an AI technology in radiology um, if I thought we were going to be in single payer, which we all thought we were. We're still fee for service, which really changes things around. And I think for the data, you know, the taxpayers have paid for a lot of data, a lot of data at NCI and NIH, and that is um, available. It's not always clear the road to get to it, but the American College of Radiology Imaging Network, Akron, has large imaging databases that are high quality and have outcomes. And so to pick and choose wisely from those databases that are that do have access, depending on the question that's being asked, I think is important. There's going to be some things we want to do with existing data, historical data, and there are other things that we're going to be you know, collecting as we go um, into the future. The trick is we can't prescribe data. Right. So for it to be ultimately valuable, um, it has to deliver. Um, deliver um, impact for humanity. And I think that as these use cases, many of which we saw this morning, really start to move the needle for patients, mm -hmm. it will attract a, a type of resource that it just hasn't seen yet. So um, how concerned are all of you about uh, the competitive landscape between the United States, which is clearly led in this kind of research, uh, and countries that are already single-payer systems? Because you know diagnostics only make sense if you win in the long run. That is, if you have the same patient, you're responsible for the cost of end-stage cancer care versus early-stage cancer uh, cure, right? Mm -hmm. it, it makes a difference who's paying. And then in terms of these large data sets that will allow us to do predictive, we imagine, uh, predictive healthcare and predictive uh, interventions, single-payer systems have an economic motivation to do that, which we currently lack. So. How concerned are all of you about, uh, about, about where the United States is going to play? I would but tweak that a little bit. Please. Um, we often, a lot of people say that, and the U.S. system, no, the U.S. non-system <laughs> is, um, is more subtle. What you said is right, except 170, 165 million Americans are covered through employer-based insurance. Mm -hmm. The employer buys insurance. I am... I. We at ASCO are self-insured, just like big businesses. So I actually live in this world personally now. It actually doesn't matter to me if my employee chooses Aetna or Blue Cross or anything else. I'm paying the first million dollars a year of losses, first 300000 for each patient and then uh, each uh, employee, and then I have stop loss above that. I'm describing this because my HR person cares desperately about early diagnostics because we're saving that money no matter which company is administering the plan. The risk is not really spread out. General Motors pays all of General Motors healthcare costs. It isn't shared risk the way people think. So I actually think it's, we're in a more optimistic situation than you say. We all actually are aligned in wanting to get the early diagnostics, save the money, keep the employee working, keep the employee's family healthy so the employee's not distracted. It actually isn't as unaligned as, as you might think, given the chaos of the system. So predict and prevent. Yeah, yeah. But how, however, if you're the imaging center, that the more you scan, the more you make. If you're the doctor, that the more you prescribe, the more you make, then... You know, That's a different issue. I agree right. with you about utilization. But the interesting thing is we should be motivated, even in our well, non-system, to be getting diagnostics. But early. should and then we haven't been. what what drives Financial. behaviors? Yeah, we you know? haven't been. I mean, I mean, do, do you see a GV? Any any appetite for uh, early diagnostic companies? Absolutely, and so we've been working pretty closely with a series of them, um, particularly in the cancer space. Um, and again, some data was presented at ASCO from Grail. There's a company called Freenome. This is a series of them. They're still developing their training sets. So we don't yet know whether these will really uh, move the needle. But if they do, and they're trying to figure that now out now, who's going to pay for it? And the exactly. hope will be the system will, because again, as you said and as Cliff said, if you can diagnose a, a lung cancer at stage one and cure that patient, you've saved an enormous amount for the system. Mm -hmm. uh, for a blood-borne test, that should be pretty straightforward. It's not a payment topic, but I would call out that another challenge with our diagnostics from a global perspective is the evolving regulatory landscape. 
and we're definitely at an early stage and our regulators are learning as well. And I think we're just going to have to be nimble and adapt and you know, work together to try and ensure that we have um, a more standardized approach globally. Okay, for fear of getting away from the um, AI, ML, computation yeah. part of the program, let's return to that. And in your, your own experiences with these tools, um, are you feeling a pressing need for new computational tools, or do you feel that where we are is, that the challenge is really using the tools that have already been developed for the applications that you want to meet? So how much are we talking about innovation in computation versus innovation in biology? I feel much more data limited than tool limited. Mm. Me too. Um, and uh, you know, I know about as much about machine learning as I've been able to learn from Manolis Kellis's um, internet-based course, um, <laughs> which is something. Uh, but um, we are data limited. We would love to know who that has intermediate AMD progresses to blindness. We would love to know who that has early stage uh, NASH progresses to fibrosis. Um, in the same way that a Tesla knows not to hit me on my bicycle. Um, but those data sets are just simply not available. They're not married up to clinical outcomes. And I gather from Regina's lecture this morning that the tools are there to analyze them. So at least at Nibber, we feel um, that the investment required is in organizing, assembling, and actually generating uh, new types of data, which came through loud and clear in Aviv's talk. Mm -hmm. you know, the idea that we can do spatial transcriptomics allows us to overlay genetic descriptors onto the, the image type that has been so effectively utilized by ML. And I think this is just a game changer. I totally agree. I, I think it's sort of the alpha omega. Like I worry the most about the data, the quality and the quantity data. And then I worry about the clinical implementation. We're going to have great tools. And are physicians and nurses, and are they going to be using them, embracing them, excited about them, knowing how to use them, how to use them well for improved outcomes? The middle part, um, all of the amazing computer scientists that have all these fabulous tools to make these um, amazing tools for us to improve the care of our patients, th that I feel like it's, it's way ahead and it's, it's waiting. But I worry about it because if, you know, if I were a student at MIT and I thought I could work in a lab where I would just be churning things out all the time because the data was there and everyone was doing exciting things every day, and then I was in a lab where it's like we're still waiting for the data, but we're getting closer, or we have the outcomes, but it turns out it's not what we thought. So I think that's where I'm just pushing so hard for that data and then really thinking a lot about how to ensure that the, the end result is going to be improved patient outcomes because the system is going to want to use it and embrace it. Our near-term opportunity is integrating the data. So we have pockets of uh, groups that are very mature in terms of their application of these tools, but linking them all together, I think, is our, our immediate need. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to call out Aviv's you know, amazing view of you know, what can be done. And one of the challenges, I think we've got this extraordinary history of medicine, right? And how much effort do we put in converting those analog historical records into something that will be useful digitally? And, or do we just say, we're just going to go forward because we can do a lot better job on, 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 on representing data computationally as we go forward rather than trying to convert our old analog data? Well, we have 30 years of history at Amgen that we absolutely need to use for going forward. So we're definitely trying to find ways to uh, convert that data and make it usable. That's definitely a, a priority for us. No, I mean, on the, along that line, I'd be curious, if you don't mind, uh, Cliff, I'd be curious how far in the future do you think we are from uh, changing the way you and I used to take care of patients where we'd make a treatment decision based on the last three patients we remember and the few colleagues we talked to versus a community oncologist sitting down in a terminal and being able to pull up 500 patients with the exact same profile that is sitting across the examining table from them and get outcome data and help shape their treatment decision. How far away are we? We're not that far. Um, we call that patients like mine, and yep. that's actually a product offering within CancerLink coming out this summer, the, the product itself has been developed. I worry a little bit about it because you could, if you were cynical, see that as anecdotalism at scale. Yep. The whole data set can be biased by preconceived notions. And I want to go on record as saying there is no replacement for the properly conducted prospective clinical trial, including real randomization and even conventional control arms at times. We can do it faster, more efficiently. We can plan the studies better because of the data. 
but I think we're not going to defy the laws of physics and gravity, and the same thing's true here. However, there are also new and novel types of, uh, of clinical research that we should be doing that we've historically not done. It's been either you're a triathlete who happens to have metastatic colon cancer and can get on to the clinical trial, or you're off study. And not leveraging those observations, not having studies for them, not having lower cost studies for those groups of people, that's a big miss. And all of this can be addressed through um, access to this data. And I'm shamelessly plugging this, but you'll know, uh, and, and you may as well, you know, we launched a trial called TAPER at mm -hmm. ASCO, which is in this gray zone. These are approved drugs, off-label, in the market, simple eligibility criteria, matched to genomic alterations, and we have 2,000 patients in about three years on this trial, and we're learning from what used to be lost yeah. anecdotal experience. So I, I think we're on our way there, and I'll answer the question. I think within five years, um, docs will be able to ascertain something like you described from Flatiron, from CancerLink, and maybe from a few other places as well. I think that's relatively low-hanging fruit. I just want to go on record to the last question and say the big problem isn't the analytics. The big problem is the data. You know, there's one other concern I'd have about um, deploying such a resource that would require aggressive um, education is entrenchment. Um, real world data has um, a requisite lag to it, and science is moving so fast, as we saw at this year's ASCO and cancer, you know, that to um, not be aware of the next um, innovation because you're biased more towards um, um, effectiveness than efficacy right. um, could actually retard the penetration of life-saving medicines. So um, we only have a few minutes left, and I want everyone to get a chance to talk about their prediction, not of the 10-year future, but the five-year future. So what do you really anticipate we're going to have in hand? You've already started. And Connie, I want to start with you simply because um, I always forget that uh, your uh, carving out this frontier of uh, machine learning for smart mammography at one of the elite centers, academic medical centers in the world, right? And um, it's a great asset for all of us who live here, but how do you think about deploying that asset in places where, frankly, the, return, the call rate back is not your 3%, but 50%? So there are plenty of mammography centers that are, um, let's just say, operating not just inefficiently, but also probably inaccurately. So if you start there, and then I'm just going to open it, and you guys talk about you know, where you, where you want to be in well, five years. So if we do this right, in five years, machines, not humans, are reading all screening mammograms, freeing up breast imagers to really focus their time with the patients. Actually, a, give us the number, because most people, I was stunned when you told me the number of positives you get per 1,000 mammograms. So my task as a breast imager is to go through 1,000 patients to find five or six cancers. And with the new modern mammography, um, that is about 200,000 images. So I'm supposed to visually inspect 200,000 images scrolling through tomosynthesis looking for five cancers. That is ridiculous. That's a ridiculous human task, and that's what we do. We do it pretty well, um, but a computer can do it much better. I'm also leaving a lot of information in that viewing station for that patient's mammogram. I'm not extracting, is she at risk of a future cancer? Is it, I may not see anything now. Can the machine see something? Or is there something that this woman should have that's different? We have very, very crude methods of screening women. All the arguments about do you start at 40 or 50 every year, or every two years, what a ridiculously limited conversation to have. We're not basing this on risk-based screening, personalized medicine, because we're not extracting all the information we have on our patients. So the routine exams, those repetitive exams, the big databases of screening, let's let computers do that so as breast imagers we can spend time with our patients, talk them through their diagnosis, spend more time doing biopsies, and also provide better access. You know, we think that there's a lot of overscreening. It's actually striking how few women in the U.S., which is one of the most heavily screened um, countries, how few women in the U.S. are actually staying up to date with even a minimum level of a mammogram every two years from age 50 and older. And that's sort of a myth that we're overscreening. We, we waste and we underutilize at the same time. So I think we'll be there in five years if we do this right. And I think that will scale out to other areas of screening imaging studies as well, such as lung cancer, et cetera. Yeah, I'll, I'll dovetail on, on this, on the development and on the 
you know, diagnostic side as well as delivery. I'm equally optimistic as Connie is that in the next five years we're going to see a whole scale change in the way we deliver and develop our drugs in terms of designing and implementing clinical trials, not necessarily getting away of randomization, but thinking about how we do clinical trials differently on the, on the delivery side, pathology, radiology uh, changing. Um, algorithms are now in place, and they haven't rolled out to major, all the major centers yet to be able to predict within the first 24 hours of a patient being admitted by analyzing all the data, including the nurse's handwritten notes, who's most likely to die in the hospital, changing the way we think about utilization for the hospital, for the payers. All those changes in the next five years are going to start rolling through institutions. So I'm pretty optimistic that this effort is going to make a meaningful impact in our delivery of healthcare. Anya? I'm going to predict that in the next five years, we'll see as much progress as we did in the last 50 years. And I'm hoping for our patients um, that we'll see you know, really significant positive outcomes and increased survival rates, even, even cures. Um, for data, I think internally we want to be fully integrated and we want to not be waiting for anything. So um, practically speaking, and we're on this road already, within five years, I think docs in practice will be getting a live dashboard of a selected number of vetted measures for their quality, not so that they can just say good or bad, but so they can intervene and improve, fill those gaps. And we will be delivering um, targeted educational materials to help them close the gaps where they're falling behind. I don't think that that's um, dreaming. I think that the commercial world is already doing this, and the model is there for how to do it, and we need to catch up. Okay. Well, you know, at Nibber, we are responsible for the concept of a drug to proof of concept in phase two, so sticking to my power alley. Um, I will say in five years, the chemist with machine learning replaces the chemist without. That perhaps operating in the background, that through generative chemistry and the functional NMR of cell painting or multi-parametric nucleic acid detection methods, um, that decision making in the fume hood will be driven by a massive amount of data, um, allowing our single chemist to operate with the strength of four, reducing the timelines for therapeutic innovation. And commensurate with that as a metric, I would expect we'll advance a novel development candidate into human clinical investigation that without machine learning, um, we would not have found. That's great. And so um, you, you all are full of optimism, and that's great to hear from people who are you know, actually you know, right there on the frontier. You know, perhaps one of the most optimistic messages that you gave us today is the coming generation, this next generation of participants are arriving in our offices, in our, in, you know, in, in our, in our labs, uh, in our companies, already bilingual. So what looks to us feels to be a very heavy lift because I can't learn a foreign language at my age without an accent. They're arriving already fully equipped to, you know, help invent the future. I want to thank you all for being with us and providing such great insights to some of the challenges and some of the exciting opportunities that are almost in our grasp. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you.